Um, yeah, turn to Romans chapter 8. And while you're turning there, I just wanted to reiterate that uh, next week is Potluck Sunday. It's always the third Sunday of the month. And also, I'd just like to highlight that we do have a couple funerals coming up. As the, ch- as the church has been blessed greatly, we also have subtractions. Um, but they're additions to heaven. Um, I'm so glad to be able to do the funeral on, on Friday, also on the 30th. We'll get that whole thing worked out. We'll do a funeral for Sunday, then we'll have a camp out for him too, or a cookout for him. That's what he would have liked. Um, so there's no conflicts there. But what an honor it is. And I just want you to know I really missed you guys a lot last week. It was such, uh, look forward greatly to coming back. And I couldn't be more pleased with what we're in today as far as the eighth chapter of Romans. In, the, in today's world, there's a lot of reasons to be upset. There's a lot of reasons to worry. There's a lot of reasons to have anger and anxiety. Um, you don't have to work yourself up to it. All you have to do is watch the news. All you have to do is go into Walmart. All you have to do is drive around the parking lot. There's, I mean, people have lost their minds in a lot of ways. There's a lot of stress. There's a lot of people not thinking. There's lots of, just a lot of stuff going on in the world where it's just, you don't, like I said, you don't have to make it up. But as this world circles the drain, so to speak, how are Christians supposed to act? How are we supposed to be? We're supposed to be salt and we're supposed to be light. We're supposed to be a city on a hill. So enabled, in order to do that, I can't just say, oh, be happy, be nice, you know, just act Christian. The, the Bible gives us like really good, solid reasons to feel this way, to act this way, <laughs> to um, emit that, to radiate that to the world. So in Romans chapter 8, we've had seven chapters before this. And the first part of Romans talks about how lost we really are without Jesus. And that's when you look at the world around us, don't hate them. Say they're lost because they don't have Jesus. It's so sad. It's It's so hopeless for them because they don't know any better. Isn't that what Jesus said? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So it's on us to show them what looks different and to tell them different and then trust God to change their hearts. So we we see how lost we were in the first couple chapters of Romans and we see what God did in his mercy is to leave his place of privilege in heaven and come down and solve this problem all by himself so that we're justified perfectly that we have great privilege with God in chapter 5 and 6. That we don't have to sin. We're no, we're no longer slaves. But lest we turn, I mean, the Old Testament is really cool because they had the law, right? But when they got the law, they used that like, we're going to be justified because we have the law. A lot of times when the gospel comes down, we go, we're going to be, we're going to be justified because of the gospel. We turn it into a new set of rules. Then we're better than everyone else because we believe the gospel. Which is just the opposite because the gospel is... You're a sinner, hellbound, and God gives you a gift of eternal life. So the true gospel and embracing the gospel doesn't make us haughty. It makes us humble. Like, who am I that God would leave heaven to save me? That's the attitude that is contagious of Christianity. We don't walk around being better than other people. We walk around knowing that we're redeemed. We were pulled out of the fire. We're trying to tell other people, you can be pulled out of the fire too. So trying to live the gospel in your own power is Romans chapter 7. So it brings us to the end of Romans chapter 7 where he says, Oh, wretched man, you know, what a wretch I am. Who can deliver me from this body of sin? Gratefully, he says, who? Because it's Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 1, or verse 1, it says, So now there is no condemnation. If you're a note taker, there's some verses here that are just prime that you should go over. I've enjoyed so much studying Romans chapter 8. It is so full. There are seven specific things in Romans chapter 8 that are just essential. The first one is there's no condemnation in chapter or verse 1. Verse 15 says, we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but have received the power, the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So we could start calling God Daddy. To think that we have a father in the universe that the king of the universe, that the creator of the universe is our dad? I mean, first of all, 
There's no condemnation, right? That means your unconditional love. Don't you think the world could do with some unconditional love? What about if everybody had a love of a father like they're supposed to have? Father wounds and father problems have caused more problems in the world than I can even count. It's amazing. I mean, I have t- I'll talk to 70-year-old men who talk about how their dad treated them. It's just as fresh as the day that it happened. And then you have the next verse that I have circled here that's a great highlight is in Romans 8.28. For we know that all things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to his purpose. So everything is working out for your good if you love God and are called according to his purpose. That gives us peace in the circumstances around us that when it looks like everything is messing up, and I'm sure you've had days and weeks like that, where everything goes wrong, nothing is right, justice is not prevailing, injustice is prevailing, bad things are happening, people are dying, people are getting sick, you're going, what's up with this? And God's going, calm down. All things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to his purpose. Just a few verses later, in verse 31, it says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Since God is for us is what it really means. Since God is for us, who does it matter is against us? It doesn't matter if God's on your side, you're in the majority. If God's on your team, you win. If you're picking up sides, pick God. You always win that, you know, that playground thing. I pick God. All right, I win. The next verse is who will condemn us? No one. In, chapter, in verse 35, it says, can anyone, anything ever separate us from Christ's love? So we're inseparable from God's love. Another verse to hold on to. And then verse 37 is, no, despite all these things, we are more than conquerors. So if you just write those verses down and ponder them through the week, verse 1, verse 15, verse 28, verse 31, verse 35, and verse 37. Those are six verses there that are together that are just powerful, and you can just take a day and think about each one of those. But there's a seventh one. It's where we left off last time in verse 19. And it's about groaning. Have you guys ever groan? <laughs> why, do you, why do you groan? Ugh. I don't want to do this anymore. You wake up in the morning, you're like, oh, it's Monday. And Tuesday. You know, Tuesday. my wife says, hey, Rich, you want to go on a walk? I'm like, oh. <laughs> Why? Because I don't want to do it. <laughs> Shouldn't you eat your vegetables? Uh. <laughs> Whatever it is you groan about, it's because you're like, oh. But I want you to know something, that the earth right now is groaning. Why? Because of all the horrible things that are happening to it and on it and in it. So very interesting words here that the Bible says. If I said this on my own, you might think I was some sort of a, you know, fruits and nuts kind of spiritualist guy. But the Bible says um, in verse 19, for all creation is waiting eagerly for the future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up into the present time. Does that not personify the earth like the earth has a spirit? Like the earth has a conscious? I mean, like I said, I didn't say this. The Bible's saying that. The Bible is personifying the earth and saying it has a capacity to go, I don't like this. I can't wait until this place is redeemed. I can't stand this. In other places in the Bible, you had um, Cain killed Abel, right? And the ground cried out for this innocent blood. The earth is groaning. The earth is moaning. The earth wants Jesus to come back and fix this mess. 
It says in verse 23, And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something we need, something we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. So there's no criticism here. The Bible says we groan. Why do we groan? Because we're in a world that's messed up. The stream of humanity is flowing one way, and Christians are going the other way. It's friction constantly. The way of the Christian is not the way of the world. So if you go the way of Christianity, you're going to have friction, you're going to have hardship, you're going to have pain. But it's the true way, and it's the right way, but we groan. Now, here's the beautiful part. It says in verse 26, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. Do you ever get to that spot you don't know what God wants you to pray for? You don't know whether to pray for healing or pray that the person be taken on away from this bad place. You don't know how to pray for that lost one. I mean, the only thing that I pray for specifically, God, please save that person. I know that his will that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. But everything else is up for grabs. He can use circumstances any way he wants to. And sometimes that means I experience pain and loss for the betterment of the kingdom, for eternity. So I don't always pray, God, deliver me from this. Sometimes I say, God, if it's your will, deliver me from this. <laughs> if there's any other way, deliver me from this. But if not, then use it for your kingdom, please. Could you please cash this in eternally? If you're suffering, you're suffering for the cause of Christ. It's for an eternal good. God doesn't allow his children to suffer needlessly. He's big enough to stop that. Did you know that? So when you suffer in 2 Corinthians, and we're going to turn there, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he said that sometimes we suffer so that we can comfort other people in their suffering. That's a bizarre way to think about it, isn't it? That sometimes I would go through something just to help you, just to help you, just to be able to say, I know where you've been, because this world is tough. So God knows we're strong enough to handle it so we can help other people through it. Sometimes we suffer in um, Hebrews chapter 11, no, it's chapter 12, because God's correcting us. So sometimes it's because you're being a knucklehead, right? Sometimes it's so we can comfort other people in their suffering. And in James chapter 1, it says, count it pure joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing that the trying of your faith worketh patience, so that the man of God will be thoroughly equipped unto all good service. So it's either for equipping you, making you sympathetic with others, or correcting you. So you say, well, this suffering, hmm, how am I supposed to know which one he's doing? I suggest you keep in close contact with him. Because <laughs> if it's for correction and you're not listening, sometimes he turns it up a little. Not because he's mean, because you need it. Some of us people don't listen until you crack us with a two by four or something, you know? But some of us will listen to the still small voice. So God is always faithful to give us the least amount. And that's when I pray for people who have gone astray, who need help. I say, God, could you please reach them as painlessly as possible? Some people don't listen to until the pain gets turned up. I can attest to that. But God does it in love. So this idea that we don't know how to pray, we can turn it over to God. We can say... I don't know what to say, God. We just be quiet. And it says the Holy Spirit groans for us in words that can't be uttered. Your spirit can just cry out and go, I'm giving this to you. I'm giving this whole thing up to you. And I have found everything in my life that I've put on that altar and went, it's yours now, God. I'm done. I can't do this. What wonderful works he does. That's when miracles happen, when we get to the end of ourselves. 
We say, I'm done. I can't do this. I can't fix this. I can't do it. And then he fixes it. You're like, wow, that was neat. He does everything better than me. Everything better than I do. He's a great God that way. So if you're struggling, give it over to God. Let the Holy Spirit plead for you. It says, um, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. The Spirit is pleading for us. I said groan before, like we all know what groaning is. Do you know what pleading is? Please. That's what the Holy Spirit's doing for us. He's pleading on our behalf. Later on, it talks about Jesus Christ doing the same thing. We're going to read a verse in just a couple of verses here where Jesus Christ is in heaven pleading for us on our behalf. <clears throat> Think about that. That's two-thirds of the Trinity pleading for you. Is God for you or God against you? Who sent the Holy Spirit? Who sent his son? And let's turn to 2 Corinthians real quick here. This is one of the most beautiful things. I never understood this part about God, because I think of God the Father as being the heavy, you know? He's the holy one, right? What would you, God is what? Judgmental, God is right, God is true, God is powerful, God is... And so I think of those things about God the Father. I don't know why I came up with that idea, but that's me. That's not the Bible, because in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, it says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all our troubles so we can comfort others when they are troubled. And we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with his comfort through Christ. So this is all parts of the Trinity that care about your pain and care about your suffering and see all the reasons why we have to worry and have fear and, and end up with anger. But the whole Trinity is working on that. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us Jesus is our advocate in heaven, and, the Holy, and God the Father is the God of all comfort. Never forget that. He didn't just have us be Christians and say, tough it out. You know, that'd be my method, not his. Because he's God our Father, not the Godfather. <laughs> Do it. In the family business, if you don't, there'll be discipline. You know, he's not a thug. So because the Holy Spirit pleads for us in this way, it says then in verse 27, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So in light of all that's happening behind the scenes and the Holy Spirit crying out for us and interceding for us, we know that all things are working together for good. Then it says, this is a really cool little passage here, the next couple verses. For God knew his people in advance, or as King James say, foreknew, and he chose them to become like his son. That would be predestined, to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them a right standing with himself. And having given them a right standing, he gave them glory. That's a beautiful thing. I want you to notice one thing about these things. They're all past tense. God foreknew you. Before you were born, he knew. And then he chose you. It says he chose you before you were born. I take great comfort in that because maybe if he waited until after I was born, he wouldn't have chose me. <laughs> That's a little joke I think Charles Spurgeon said. But he knew us and he chose us. And then he called us. So even though he knew in advance and he chose us in advance, he still decided to call us in advance. And then it says, then he justified us or made us right with him. And then it says, and then he glorified us. If you look like in Colossians chapter 3, it talks about 
the past tense of God doing all these things, that we are seated in the heavenlies with him perfected. Like, well, I don't feel like I'm seated in the heavenlies perfected. I feel like I'm sitting right here unperfected. See, God sees the past from the present. We look at the timeline that we're on right now like a parade. Here comes one float, there goes another float, there goes another float. You know, first it's coming, there it is, there it's gone. God sees it like the Goodyear blimp. He sees the beginning from the end. He knows and he chooses and he calls and he justifies and he glorifies. That's why we know that we know that we know that we're saved. Because what part of this do we have a part in? We don't foreknow anything, do we? We didn't choose him, he chose us. We don't make ourselves righteous, he makes us righteous. I mean, there is a part of this that's on you. What's that? Yes, I'm a sinner. Yes, I am messed up and I need someone to save me. If you're messed up and you need someone to save you, then you're a ripe, prime candidate to be a Christian. If you got this thing, you're all, you got it all worked out, everything's good, you're no candidate for Christianity. Because God saves sinners, of whom I am the greatest. That's what Paul said. So God, in his glory, and God, in his omniscient, powerful love, did all this work for us. And he just wants us to say, yes. And so, after that, it says, what can we say about such wonderful things? I mean, that's, a, that's mind-blowing, isn't it, that he did all that? What can we say about that? If God is for us, who can be against us? If the God of this universe feels that way about us and has already predetermined us and loved us and picked us and justified us and glorified us, who can ever be against us? It says, since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own, no one. For God himself has given us right standing with him. Who then will condemn us? Who will condemn you? There's self-condemnation, right? But if you condemn yourself, you're going against God. The devil condemns you, right? But when he does, he's lying against God. The world will condemn you, but when they do, they're going against God. Who can justifiably condemn you? No one. It says, who then will condemn us? In verse 34, no one. For Christ died for us and was raised to life for us and sitting at the place of honor, God's right hand pleading for us. So there's no condemnation in the Trinity. They're all about saving us and pleading for us and on our behalf. The condemnation comes from our own consciences. The condemnation comes from our own ideas from the world's ideas, from the devil's ideas. That's not God's plan. The Holy Spirit does convict us. Don't get me wrong, but you know what conviction looks like? Get back up, you can do it. You know what condemnation looks like? Stay down, you'll never be what you're supposed to be. Why don't you just quit? But God's conviction says, come on, you can do it like a father, like a loving father. So in verse 35, it says, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or are hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. And we are being slaughtered like sheep. So he's saying, will that separate us from God? The, the present time that we live in, when Christians can go hungry, when Christians can be persecuted, when Christians can, when the world can turn on the Christians, where we are persecuted and killed like sheep all the day long? The answer is no. No. That's what I love what the Bible says. No. Despite all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. More than conquerors. We don't just win the battle here. We're not like the fighting lambs. Like we're going to watch football teams maybe this afternoon. You don't even see the fat fighting lambs, do you? <laughs> what do lambs do? Lambs get slaughtered. 
sheep get shorn. They're not fighters, are they? That's what we are, but who's on our side? God's on our side. So through this, we are more than conquerors. We're not just conquerors in this world. We are transcendently victorious because we're identified with Christ. You talk about a cause to die for, a cause to live for. We are married to God. We are his union with him, representing him now and throughout all eternity, a picture of his grace. There's no higher calling than that. We are more than conquerors. We don't win here. We win forever. This, if we won the world, it would be a temporary thing. Think about this. When Satan got Adam to fall, what did he do? He won the world. It's his domain. It's his dominion. Jesus brought it back. And in Revelation, it says, who is worthy to open the scroll? Who is worthy to redeem this place? He is. We win it all back. But not just this place, eternity we win. We're more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. So no matter what happens to us, whatever calamity, whatever you see going on in the world around you, you're not condemned. You have a father. You're in a community of people with the world and with the community around you who is in union groaning about this thing. But all these things work together for good. To him are called according to his purpose. And no one can condemn us. If God be for you, who can be against you? And nothing can separate us from his love. So we know eternally this thing is sealed. Despite this, we are more than conquerors. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. So have you ever thought that there's something that could get between you and God? Think of anything you can. Anything that would separate you from God's love. And I'll read this list and you see if, if you're on it. If, if anything on, that you're thinking of is on it. Neither death nor life. Life or death can't separate you. Nor angels or demons. Nor our fears for today. Nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. No created thing. So what, what do you think could get between you and God? It's kind of inclusive, isn't it? Like nothing. This is nothing, it means nothing. And, it, and just because we might get something in there, he goes, is it a created thing? Is it a thing above, below? Deathly, lifely? Anything. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. So this love is eternal, it's perfect. And if you look at I'm not a fan of psychology. It's not like my favorite thing. But psychologically speaking, when you look at verse 1, what would unconditional love do for a person? When you look at verse 15, what would a perfect father's love do for a person? In verse 28, what if you had the assurance of your circumstances? What would that do for a person? If God is for you, who could be against you? In verse 31, what would that do for you? If you had future proof that God would never stop loving you, in verse 35, what would that do? If you had transcendent meaning in your life, like you were fighting for a cause that could not be erased in the universe forever, what would that do for your life? See, these things that God has for us, they're, they're perfectly tailored for exactly what you need in the world around you. He's a perfect, loving father. He knows you better than you know yourself. So he lays out these seven things. I listed six. The seventh thing is in that verse 18 through 27 where we started, which was that, as, that assurance of community, that you're not alone in this. You're not alone in this. God did not save us. God did not call us to his body, to his, to his bride, to be alone. A Christian alone is a Christian at risk. At risk of a lot of things. One thing being weird. Um, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm serious. I'll just say this right out. When I find Christians that are forsaking the gathering of themselves together, um, a good friend of mine, um, I was able to talk to while I was on vacation. And it was like, the more they stay away from the body of Christ, the more crazy stuff they believe. It's like, have you ever known a kid that was all by themselves and didn't have a brother or sister to go, 
knock it off, that's weird, stop doing that. <laughs> we need each other to encourage each other to say, get up, it's okay. Or to say, I'm going through the same thing myself. Did that phrase, misery loves company? Yeah. It's very true. You can be having the worst week of your life and talk to a Christian brother and sister and go, wow, I can't believe I'm open around like this. They really have it tough. No matter where you're at, whatever station you're at in life, when you talk to other Christians and come around them, there's encouragement, there's a, there's a, if you're way too far out there on a subject, they'll look at you and go, hmm, you're, you're sounding a little weird. What if you don't have Christian brothers and sisters to tell you that? Well, then you'll just stay that way. We're made to be put in community with each other. We have that in common. The earth groans, we groan. The Holy Spirit groans with us. We all groan together. And praise God when we come in here today and we raise the roof with song, we all praise God together. I mean, I, I like to praise God by myself, but it doesn't get that good <laughs> when I'm praising God by myself. It gets good when I'm here so much that so I'm like, okay, we can just go to heaven now. I don't, I don't have to teach. That's fine. We're, we're good. We'll just, like my brother said before I got up here, don't screw it up. <laughs> so encouraging things for you as we go through life is to look through Romans chapter 8, pull out those seven things and go, I can look at each one of them like a, it's, its own jewel, its own wonderful thing, but they're all packed in one chapter. Now, because we have reality, we're going to do chapter 9 next week. Chapter 9, chapter 10, and 11 are the problems with Christianity. Why? Because Christianity is not just a, well, the thing that involves is people. And whenever you get people involved, well, you know, <laughs> there's a reason why we needed a Savior. And there's, there's a reason why the Bible calls us children and sheep, because we need help. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for explaining things to us, like in Romans here, where we have so many points that can keep us on track, so many points to encourage us, Lord. Uh, we know that you care for us. So I pray as a body, Lord, we'd be there for each other. As, a, as an individual, Lord, we would stay close to you so we could benefit the body. I thank you for this opportunity to come together um, in a free place and worship you. May you have all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.